Does a car's name have to be majestic or just sound like it to be successful? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2006. TSN's Motoring 2006 is brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward. As we all know in the automobile industry, the status quo went out the window with the proverbial bathwater many years ago. But one thing remains the same. General Motors and Ford continue to spin their wheels. Toyota is poised to become the number one automaker in the world. And maybe the most interesting story is that the Japanese are actually feeling the heat from the Koreans, as in Hyundai and Kia. In fact, Kia claims to be the world's fastest growing automaker. Well, in this country last year, they did sell more cars than ever before. And their product lineup is the youngest in the industry, nothing older than two years. Well, this week, we're gonna check out the second generation Magentus, a vehicle that is not only new, but are you ready for this? It's actually cheaper than its predecessor. The Kia Magentus, we're very excited about that product. Brand new entry in the marketplace for us. It's a tremendous vehicle. It allows us to attract a, a wide spectrum of people. And it's just another example of the product that we're bringing to the Canadian marketplace. From the Rio that we introduced this year to the Sedona to the now Magentus, we have a whole raft of new product coming to the marketplace. By the fall, Kia will have the youngest product lineup in the industry. It's surprising. Also, you know, I'm surprised that Kia is still in Canada because if you remember like seven years ago, they came with was basically crap. I mean, bad cars and the dealer network that was just left over from other companies. And now they, they're doing pretty well in Canada and worldwide also they're doing pretty well because they have well-priced products which are pretty well adapted to the markets and they're pretty smart people. This vehicle is available in two power plants, four-cylinder and a six-cylinder. The four-cylinder brings out 161 horsepower. That's a substantial increase over the previous generation, which was 135 horsepower. Uh, the six-cylinder engine brings out 185 horsepower. Uh, again, a substantial increase over the previous generation. Uh, we feel that the market in Canada is going to have the main focus on the four-cylinder power plants. The plan for the second evolution vehicle is to really hit home with the consumer. We've dropped the price, we've increased the standard equipment. Um, this vehicle on the base model dropped by $555. We've added six airbags. Now there's six airbags that are standard. Standard ABS with electronic brake distribution, active headrests, which are anti-whiplash. So this vehicle really speaks to the consumer in terms of safety, not to mention performance and styling. To be honest, this is a great surprise for us today. Uh, imagine this first generation was horrible car. <laughs> it was bad driving. Every time we were putting that car into a Comparo, it was losing a big gap uh, behind the other competitors. This new generation of the Magentis, I think, shows how much Korean manufacturers can improve their quality. And very, it's a big evolution, it's a big step. Uh, I was thinking that if some American manufacturers we won't name were doing that kind of evolution between the generations, they wouldn't be worrying about their number one position. It's hard to find fault with that car because at that price, also it's well equipped. Though the car we drove were well made, it's surprising. And since that 2.7 V6 engine is a bit smaller than the one used on the Sonata, I expected something you know that would be a bit uh, underpowered, but we seem to be okay on the road we've driven today. Uh, it's okay and it, it's very quiet. On a car below $30,000, I mean, it's quite impressive. Fit and finish, uh, the material they're using, nothing like the cheap plastic that you don't want to touch. Uh, I would say driving. Driving is, wow, nice suspension, nice chassis today. We're, we're driving a little four-cylinder engine, great, 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 great V6, very smooth engine, very smooth transmission. When you're 
speaking about two, three thousand dollars less for that car than the competition, but you've got everything in it, even the heated seats. I loved it. We'd like to go after everybody. We're 2% market share. We need to take it from everybody. We need to take it from the domestics, the imports, everybody in the marketplace. And the brand of Kia is about the power to surprise. And what I mean by power to surprise, I mean the entire value of the product is uh, second to none. I don't have all the answers on how to make our drivers better, but I do have a couple of questions. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Over the years, Toyota's earned a reputation for building stylistically boring vehicles. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at a vehicle that turns the page. This is the 2007 FJ Cruiser. If you're old enough, you probably recognize the FJ as a direct descendant of the FJ40 Land Cruiser. From the round headlights to the wraparound rear quarter windows and offset license plate, the look is unmistakable. Its ability when the going gets tough is also unmistakable. To begin with, the FJ earns good approach and departure angles, as well as almost 10 inches of ground clearance, all of which minimizes the risk of getting the FJ hung up when you're off-road. When it's time to go off-roading, you've got several options with this FJ. Pushing the lever forward locks the center transfer case. Moving it over and forward again selects low range. If you need more help, you simply push the A-Track button and that advanced traction control system, again with the low range gear set, well it'll take this FJ where other 4x4s fear to tread. The other thing I like is a button that means you don't have to do a hill start if you stall it when you're climbing a slippery hill. You don't panic, you select first gear, push this button, hit the ignition key and away we go. The FJ equipped with a six-speed manual gearbox earns a proper full-time all-wheel drive system that sends 40% of the power to the front wheels and 60% to the rear. Should the wheels begin to spin, the torsion center differential automatically locks, which then splits the power evenly. In an off-road situation, the advanced A-Track traction control system then ensures the tire with grip is the tire that gets the power because it applies the appropriate brake. The odd part is that for those that do want to take an automatic transmission, well, you're going to have to make do with a part-time four-wheel drive system. While this thing is as good off-road, it cannot match the full-time system when it comes to on-road driving. The other irony is that the automatic transmission delivers much better fuel economy than the manual. Go figure. You know, when you get behind the wheel of this FJ Cruiser, well, you'll find some really neat stuff. To begin with, the seats are water repellent. You can hose the floor off after you've been off-roading. The controls, all large enough to be operated with a gloved hand. There's an auxiliary plug-in for your iPod or MP3 player. The radio sounds the way it should. And then you get these three dials up the top. Now, I like the compass and I like the outside temperature. The third dial, I'm not quite sold on. While it's great for telling you how steep the hill is, you're going up or down, when it comes to the amount of body roll in a fast corner, well, sometimes that information, it's a little bit too much. The other pet peeves, two major ones. Number one, the sight lines because of this very small greenhouse are awful. You can't see a traffic light without peering underneath the windshield header and backing into a spot without this park assist while well, it's very difficult. The other problem, when you're bouncing around off-road, you've got to make sure your head doesn't hit this handle. I've got a goose egg to prove how hard it is. It should be of the collapsible variety. Power comes from a stout 4.0-litre V6 engine that puts 239 horsepower and 278 pound-feet of torque at the driver's disposal. On road, this brings an enthusiastic launch off the line and plenty of passing power. Off road, when the strong torque number is run through the low-range gear set, the FJ saunters up impossibly steep hills without so much as breaking a sweat. The brakes follow this lead. 
With a decent anti-lock system and four-wheel discs being standard equipment, the FJ comes to rest from 100 km an hour in just 39.8 meters, making it one of the better in the SUV class. Those sight lines I talked about, well this spare tire being mounted on the back end here, it eats about a half of what you can see through the rear window. I don't like its placement. I do like, however, the fact you can open the glass independently in this rear wiper. When you open up the tailgate, which is hinged on the right side, that means you can offload your stuff without having your back to traffic. When it comes to space, there's a ton of it. With the seats up, there's plenty. Fold them down and it grows to 66.8 cubic feet. The other thing I like, 110 volt outlet in the back end here. As for ride and handling, you pretty much get what's expected of an off-road oriented vehicle. While the front double wishbones do work very nicely, the solid rear axle tends to hop about a bit on broken pavement. The saving grace is the standard stability control system. As well as providing the basics for the A-Track traction control system, it also breaks the appropriate wheel and backs out of the gas should the FJ begin to oversteer or understeer. The resulting stability it imparts, well let's just say it's much appreciated. The reaction to this FJ Cruiser has been overwhelming. On the one hand, you've got those people that think that the J stands for joke. What the F stands for? Well, I'll leave that to your imagination. On the other hand, you've got a group of people that love the look, love the utility, and really appreciate just how good this thing is when you go off-road. Now, I tend to side with the latter, with but one exception. Marrying a part-time four-wheel drive system with the automatic transmission in this day and age, well, that is unforgivable. It's time to check out our newest member to the motoring long-term garage. It's a 2006 Hyundai Sonata, a vehicle that won our Family Car of the Year with an under $35,000 price sticker. Now, you know, we're always talking about how the Koreans are improving and still trying to catch the Japanese. Well, believe me, with this Sonata, it has arrived. It can take on the big boys like Camry, Accord, and Altima. It comes loaded with standard features. The 3.3-liter V6 pumps out 235 horsepower power and along with the four cylinder is completely new. Now the Honda Civic won our overall car of the year but believe me on any other given year the Sonata could have taken the crown but we'll find out over the next few months if our first impressions were indeed correct. Here we are launching the latest generation of the biggest selling car in North America and that's that's a great great starting point but it's also the challenge because everybody thinks that he or she knows what a Camry is about and what we're what we're setting out to do with this car is to radically change people's impressions of Camry and by doing that change people's impressions of Toyota it's not your grandpa's Camry anymore the car is completely different than the previous edition which is what the company was trying to do and I think they've probably done it it's not changed enough to get rid of the people that love their Camrys now and to make them go, oh God, you know, we don't want to look at these anymore. But I think it's, it's certainly good enough, quick enough, uh, and fun to drive enough that we'll certainly look at the car. This is a vehicle which retains all the best of, uh, you know, of the previous generations of Camry, all that quality, dependability, reliability, the smoothness, the, uh, the comfort and the, the quiet that comes with Camry and uh, a 3.5 liter engine, six, uh, six speed automatic transmission. So when you look at this new car, you'll see a striking new design and a whole lot of emotion about this vehicle that, uh, that people don't normally associate with Camry. They were saying that vanilla is one of the things that describes the car, but vanilla is still you know, the best selling ice cream too. So you know, they want to position the car to be the best selling sedan in Canada. So they've got a shot, I think, if they can get that new audience in to look at it. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the ultimate concept, 
in rugged elegance. We call it the Ford F-250 Super Chief. This concept, as you can see, pushes the limits, not just of how bold and elegant trucks can become. It was inspired by a uniquely American story, the epic journey, and the iconic locomotives of the 20th century, like the Super Chief, that crisscrossed this nation. The front end picks up the powerful geometry of the historic locomotives and marries it to Ford's bold American three-bar grille. Now inside, you sit in one of four large leather chairs with ottomans that automatically deploy out of the floor. And passengers can gaze out of the all-glass roof for panoramic view of the sky. While underfoot, there's an exquisite walnut floor that spans not only the cabin, but right back into the bed. Under the forward tilting hood is the most advanced truck engine ever. It's a supercharged V10 capable of burning three different fuels, gasoline, E85 ethanol, or hydrogen. And that means we can take advantage of ethanol today, it's a renewable fuel, while we build on tomorrow's hydrogen world. You know, Kia is hoping for big things from its brand new Magentas as they look to the future. You know, Kia has been around Korea for over 62 years, but arrived on our shores back in 1999. But as they look forward, they plan on being among the top five automakers in the world by 2011. How about that? All right, let's head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner. Hey, Brad, those Kia guys are going to have me eating crow. You know, I was telling jokes about them for a while, but... Uh they're definitely coming up. They've got, uh, they've improved the quality of their cars. They're giving a lot of bang for the buck. Fuel efficiency, it's all there. They're definitely gonna sell a lot of cars in the future. Now, what we wanna talk about today is the effects of temperature on your vehicle. Now, it's a real hot day out here today. We've got 30 degrees Celsius air temperature, and they've predicted that this summer is gonna be one of the hottest ever. So let's talk about some of the things you can do to minimize the impact that hot weather is gonna have on you and your vehicle. First of all, make sure you're not driving on underinflated tires. I see cars on the highway all the time with grossly underinflated tires and they get away with it because the outside temperature is so low. A day like today when it's 30 Celsius, you're not going to get away with stuff like that. You're going to ruin your tires, maybe blow them and run the risk of having a problem on the highway. So don't run on underinflated tires. Secondly, under, under the hood, make sure that all the fluids on your vehicle are not only topped up but are of good quality. The, the proper fluid for the job and change at the right intervals. For example, I see lots of my customers' cars coming in down one liter or more of oil. Well, many of those cars only hold four liters of oil, so if they're down one liter, there's 25% of their oil capacity missing. And that oil is the second line of defense in cooling the engine. The primary line of defense, of course, is the coolant in the radiator. Make sure you're not running around with a bad rad because this kind of weather that we've got today is the kind of stuff that's going to do some damage to your car. In terms of uh, your own comfort, little things can do a lot. For example, on our, on our Ridgeline pickup, we've got a, a moonroof in it, and you know if you pull that shade across, you remember to pull that shade across when you park the vehicle and crack the windows open a little bit while it's parked, big difference on the cabin temperature when you get back in. Use your, your air conditioner when you need to, but think about turning it off just before you park it and give it a minute or two, the last minute or two of your drive to dry out the AC condenser, get all the moisture off it before you park the car. That'll help the life of your AC system. Make sure that, uh, that your engine doesn't need a shampoo. In other words, if it's coated with a fur of muck and grease and guck that's come out because you've got some minor oil leaks and never taken care of them. That's like a fur coat for the engine. You need to wash that off. There's dozens of things you can do to help the life of your car in the summertime. And even driving it a little bit easier or putting higher octane fuel in it if it's knocking or pinging can all help. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2006.
I don't know what the most recent statistic is, but something like 25 to 30 percent of all fatal crashes are caused by drunk drivers. It's a terrible scourge. We have to do more about it, although there has been some progress. But you know, it got me to thinking. If 30 percent of the crashes are caused by drunk drivers, that means 70 percent of the crashes are caused by people who aren't drunk. In other words, we can't drive when we're sober. And if there has ever been a better argument for better driver training and tougher licensing procedures, I don't know what it is. Other statistics have shown that the biggest cause of crashes, something like 70%, is caused by inattention. People simply not paying attention to the task. It might be the cell phone. It might be eating your hamburger. It might be doing both at once. I think I've mentioned before, my daughter saw the all-time champion, a guy driving on a highway with a camcorder watching a movie while he's driving. People, this has to stop. There's all sorts of ways to get distracted. Driving is tough enough without paying full attention to the task. This all stems from sitting properly in the car, we've talked about that before, adjusting your mirrors correctly, we've talked about that before, keeping your eyes moving front, sides, and back, making sure you know exactly where you are at all times. Pay attention to horns, pay attention to kids playing on the street. If you see a cat run across the street, chances are a dog's gonna be chasing it shortly thereafter. A ball running across the street, it might be a kid. It's the most serious thing you do, it's the most dangerous thing you do. So please, when you're occupying this vehicle, driving this weapon on the streets, can you at least pay attention? I'm Jim Kenzie. As I mentioned earlier, the Koreans are on the move. Why? Well, like the Kia Magentus, the quality has improved immensely. In fact, while driving this vehicle, some of us felt like we were in a Toyota product. It's quiet, a good ride, good looking, and hey, it's cheaper than last year's model. And speaking of last year, they sold fewer than a thousand Magentas. Well, the company line is they'd love to hit 6,000, but their head marketing guy, who's been in this business for over 25 years, said he wouldn't be surprised if they hit 10,000. Well, if they do, Kia can certainly hang on to its bragging rights as being the world's fastest growing automaker. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Introducing the 2007 RVX from Acura. In many ways, the second generation of the MDX is even more difficult to do than the first generation. We're not creating a new niche anymore. We're just raising the bar. We're making a new level of excellence. TSN's Motoring 2006 has been brought to you by the new Q from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward.